Good afternoon. My name is Gajendra Singh. I will be basically conducting the proceedings of this presentation. Uh, first of all, I'd like to request Mr. Ube Muravets, Chairman of the Board of Directors of the International Peace Foundation, to make his remarks. Mr. Ube. Ladies and gentlemen, friends, as the first series of bridges, Dialogues Towards a Culture of Peace, reaches its final highlight, today with the keynote speech of Professor Robert Huber, I would like to take this opportunity on behalf of the International Peace Foundation to thank our major partners and sponsors, especially the Asian Institute of Technology and Gassikon Bank, to make this series of 100 events which started in November 2003 possible. As a contribution to the Decade for a Culture of Peace and Nonviolence, initiated by the United Nations General Assembly, 10 Nobel laureates as well as other keynote speakers and artists, including the Reverend Jesse Jackson, Masia Haide, and Ismail Ivo, Dr. Karan Singh, Gareth Evans, Damanito Rodick, and Jakob von Uxkul, came to Thailand without any fee or honorarium to promote the kingdom as a center for dialogue and international understanding. Her Royal Highness Princess Maha Chakri Sirinton graciously presided over several events which in total reached an audience of 30,000 participants, including different target groups thanks to a variety of partners ranging from major universities and ministries to the Royal Thai Army, businesses, NGOs, and the diplomatic corps, which hosted the events in cooperation with the International Peace Foundation. I would now like to invite you and draw your attention to the final concert of Jesse Norman, one of the most distinguished concert and opera singers of our time, who will perform for the first time in Thailand on May the 2nd at the main hall of the Thailand Cultural Center. This concert is presented by the International Peace Foundation in Toshiba, Thailand, in cooperation with the Bangkok Opera and the Bangkok Symphony Orchestra Foundation to celebrate the auspicious occasion of the sixth birthday cycle of Her Majesty the Queen, who has graciously accepted to preside over this charity event. All proceeds will benefit the support foundation of Her Majesty the Queen. After the final concert with Jesse Norman on May the 2nd, we will take a six month break to evaluate the first series of bridges, dialogues towards a culture of peace, taking into account all the valuable advice and guidance we have so far received we will also prepare a book documentation with all dialogues and keynote speeches and then start to organize the second and final series of bridges with additional 100 events being hosted in Bangkok, Chiang Mai, Konken, and Songkla from November 2004 until April 2005. For this second series, 22 Nobel laureates for peace, physics, chemistry, medicine, literature, and economics such as Clive Granger, Nobel Laureate for Economics of 2003, Shirin Ebadi from Iran, Bishop Bello from East Timor, and Sean Hume from Northern Ireland have already confirmed their participation, as well as other keynote speakers, including Butrus Butrus Ghali, former United Nations Secretary General, Anthony Giddens, Director of the London School of Economics, artist Robert Rauschenberg, and writer Vario Magas Loza. On behalf of the team of volunteers who have worked almost day and night to make the Bridges event series possible. I kindly invite you to join me in especially thanking Christian Grafschafter from Austria. <laughs> Janis Hegwein from Germany. <laughs> and Superporn Manit Ponsot and Tawon Praraj from Thailand. The International Peace Foundation is honored to present to you now a uh, Nobel Laureate for Chemistry, Professor Robert Huber, who also came to Thailand without any fee or honorarium to support the events. And I greatly look forward to his keynote speech and his important contribution to build bridges. Thank you very much.
Thank you, Mr. Morawitz. Now I'd like to request uh, Professor John Louis Arma, AIT president, to welcome the guests as well as introduce the speaker. Good afternoon, Professor Robert Huber, Mr. Uwe Moravets and your colleagues, Mr. Provost, deans, faculty colleagues, staff, students, and our guests from Bangladesh and Sri Lanka who are science teachers visiting AIT and learning, I hope, at AIT. It's a privilege, it's an honor to have you with us today. I would like to express on this occasion of uh, Mr. Moravet's uh, speech, you know, our gratitude to the International Peace Foundation, to the Bridges Program, to your colleagues for this tremendous opportunity you gave us, you know. When I was a professor in another life in the States or in Europe, you know, we, to have the ultimate goal was to bring a Nobel Prize laureate to our institutions, whether it's in Europe or in the States, you know. And we have succeeded on six occasions, I believe, thanks to you. And of course, thanks to the Nobel laureates, you know, who have very generously accepted to give their time, you know, and contribute to this institution. I would like to, Professor Huber, say a few words about your work. I will not go into too much detail because you will enlighten us in a few minutes. Let me just say that you have received your doctorate from the Technical University of Munich in chemistry, I gather. <laughs> in 1972, you joined the staff of the Max Planck Institute for Biochemistry in Martinsried in Germany. And this is where you conducted this award-winning research with your PhD student, Johann Deisenhofer, and Hartmut Michael. And then you have alternatively worked there at the Max Planck Institute and at the Munich Technical University. By the way, I'd like to take advantage of this meeting to express our gratitude to the Munich Technical University with which we have a joint cooperative program. We have exchange of students for the past, I would say, 10 years at least. It is not in chemistry, it's not in biochemistry, it's in industry engineering and robotics mainly. But we have this exchange and we are very, very proud. You are, presumably, an internationally recognized expert in the use of X-ray diffraction to determine the atomic structure of complex molecules such as proteins. Together with your colleagues, you have used technique to determine the structure of a, a protein complex called a photosynthetic reaction center that is essential to photosynthesis in certain bacteria. And I'm sure that all of us will be looking very much forward to your speech, in spite of the fact that very few of us are really truly chemists, but we are looking very much forward to your speech and we would like to again, express our gratitude to you for giving so generously your time to come to AIT and to lecture on this topic. Thank you. problem with the power supply. Chavarat? No, no, it's okay. So it was on before, yes. and now it... Uh,
Well, I probably have to restart because uh, it lost uh, track. Uh, now, thank you. Right. Thank you, uh, President uh, Armo. Thank you, Professor Singh, for the invitation. I'd like to come. Science and peace, uh, in fact, do have uh, strong relationships because uh, science is truly global, truly international. And your institute, uh, the Asian Institute of Technology, is a wonderful example of the uh, internationality. Uh, the students uh, coming to your institute uh, from many countries, in particular, of course, the Southeast Asian uh, uh, area. This is uh, promoting peace, no doubt. Science lives on exchange of uh, uh, knowledge uh, lives on communication of the people and uh, people who talk to each other won't shoot at, at, at each other. That's my strong uh, belief. But not all our scientists, uh, there is terrorism in the world. Uh, uh, so what we should do as scientists, communicate uh, and uh, transport our experience uh, to others and uh, teach them how to live together peacefully, which uh, something that scientists normally uh, do. Well, the title of my lecture is perhaps somewhat uh, misleading. Uh, I'm talking about uh, carbon monoxide utilizing bacteria, but in a very special way, namely picking out uh, essential proteins uh, which allow these bacteria to use uh, carbon monoxide. Now we look at them with the eyes of a chemist and of a structural biologist. So what proteins are these? What is special uh, for them? How can they use CO that is, as we know, uh, extremely toxic for us? Now they use it and they live on it. Uh, use, it use CO as the sole carbon source and as the sole source of energy. Now, <clears throat> these are special proteins, and I would like to uh, tell you about these proteins. That is work, by the way, that has nothing to do with the work that led to the uh, Nobel Prize. Uh, my department, my group, is a very large one, and we usually work on, uh, let's say, 10 to 15 different uh, projects at the same time, proteins uh, that, uh, let's say, may be interesting for medicine. They may be interesting for crop science. Uh, but we use a technique that is unique, a technique that allows us to visualize these tiny objects, proteins, at atomic resolution. Now atomic resolution means that we have to resolve atoms that have distances of about one angstrom. And there is a basic physical law which says that in order to resolve uh, objects optically we need light with a wavelength of that same order of magnitude. In order to resolve 
atomic distances, we need light of a one angstrom wavelength, and this is X-rays. So uh, we cannot use a microscope with optical light. Uh, its wavelength is uh, several thousand times too long to resolve uh, atomic details. Uh, with X-rays, we can do that, but there are problems behind uh, this. The problems are that there are uh, no lenses available for X-rays, like uh, uh, there are lenses uh, for optical light. So the main problem in the last, I would say, 50 years or so, in the development of protein crystallography, on which I spoke uh, uh, at Shula University this uh, morning, was to find methods to develop an X-ray microscope, in a sense. Now, for that purpose, we need, of course, the protein material that we want to study in relatively large quantities. Uh, and usually, we make these large quantities of proteins recombinant. You see, we make it in bacteria because most of the proteins we are interested in are rare. Uh, proteins of medical interest human proteins. So we cannot uh, obtain them from natural sources. We have to make them recombinant. And therefore, the development of molecular biology was essential uh, for uh, structural biology and protein uh, crystallography. Second, we make use of special X-rays that are generated as a waste in synchrotrons. Now, these synchrotrons were built by the physicists and by the engineers to produce particles and to shoot them against each other, to study the forces that hold atoms together. Now this is done by accelerating electrons, positrons, to near light velocity and send them in a circle uh, in, around in such a synchrotron ring system. And during this in this process of accelerating charged particles, X-rays are generated. A very powerful uh, uh, source of X-rays, so many thousand times more powerful than our conventional X-ray generators, which we use at home and which you know perhaps uh, from uh, uh, a doctor which uh, X-rays you. Uh, these we still use for homework, but uh, most of the work uh, that we carry out uh, with our crystals is using synchrotron radiation. So we clearly draw from both sides, from the biologists, take their methods to make our material. We draw from the physicists and engineers, take their X-rays. Uh, uh, when we discovered that uh, there are these X-rays and synchrotrons are very useful, we went to the to the physicists and asked them to, to to use them. They were very reluctant because we disturbed their their their, their work. Uh, you see, and so we were called parasites, and we were given parasitic time. Uh, so when they were sleeping or or uh, in the night, then they uh, gave us the the uh, the uh, uh, access to to synchrotron. Now times have changed and synchrotrons are built for us, for the biologists, for the biochemists. There are some in the neighborhood in Japan in particular, in Korea, uh, in China, uh, and so on. 
Well, uh, this, there is a third point I would like to mention. Again, showing how interdisciplinary uh, research has uh, become. When I say I'm a biochemist, then uh, I use physical methods. Uh, I use uh, molecular biology. And we use computer science uh, because uh, we produce millions uh, of data each hour when we uh, take X-ray photographs of our crystals and process them. And for that purpose, we need uh, faster uh, computers and in particular data transfer systems from the detector to the computer. Uh, and we need graphic systems. And all you will see here now in the following uh, half an hour or so is models of these molecules that are based on the experiments. And the experiments give us distributions of electron densities. Now these we can, and I think you will see that, easily interpret in atomic models. The electron density is a faithful picture of the atomic structure uh, of a molecule if it has high enough resolution. Now these are extremely complex, would be extremely complex pictures because there, there may be 10 or 20,000 atoms uh, very irregularly spaced, uh, making up this molecule. We wouldn't recognize anything. So we have to uh, reduce the information in order to make the principle of a particular protein structure visible uh, at all. So all you will see now in the following are such reductionist pictures of the protein. In reality, uh, each of these dots I'm showing is the average position of perhaps 10 or 20 individual atoms, whose positions, however, we know. But if you would show them, then the picture would be uh, uh, completely uninterpretable. Now, <clears throat> so far, a few words about the basis uh, of uh, uh, methods uh, of my work. And now I come to uh, the theme of this uh, uh, lecture, which is about uh, life on carbon monoxide. And I said already this is, uh, uh, was of great interest to us because CO is to us very toxic, but there are bacteria that manage to live on it. And I'm describing two or three systems from different bacteria, anaerobic and aerobic bacteria, that both use CO to live on uh, in very, with, using very different machines uh, that transform CO, but uh, both do it uh, very efficiently. Now, let me say a few things uh, more uh, of uh, general importance. Now this slide shows that there are other simple gaseous substrates around which are used in biology. There is of course dioxygen which we breathe and uh, uh, this is uh, consumed in mitochondria, for instance, and uh, water is generated. And in that uh, strongly exergonic, exergonic process, uh, energy and uh, uh, compounds are generated that are rich in energy. So we need dioxygen <coughs> to uh, supply us with, with energy. And there is a key component in these proteins 
uh, in, in this protein system that uh, makes that possible. This is called cytochrome C oxidase. Uh, a very large protein complex, but it has as a key factor a metal complex which uh, binds the dioxygen and uh, then uh, uh, reduces it to uh, water. And uh, the energy uh, generated in this process is used uh, to generate a proton gradient across the cell membrane and then this in turn is used to make uh, an energy rich uh, phosphate compound, namely uh, ATP. I just want you to realize that there are metals involved, and there is, this is a unique iron copper complex that we find here in the cytochrome C oxidase. There is a nitrogenase. This is a protein that uh, reduces dinitrogen to ammonia. This is uh, a process that occurs in certain uh, bacteria which uh, are able to make use of the rather inert gaseous dinitrogen. Of course, this process uses up a lot of energy, ATP, and it has for that purpose a extremely complex iron containing molybdenum cofactor. There are hydrogenases which uh, deal with uh, another gaseous ligand, dihydrogen. Either it can make hydrogen or it can uh, use it for energy production. And here we do have two different kinds. We have a, a diiron, an all iron hydrogenase, and we have an iron-nickel hydrogenase. So it's quite fantastic how nature builds up very complex metal cofactors that uh, otherwise we cannot make. The chemists have not been able to make uh, from simple iron sulf sulfur molybdenum uh, components these uh, clusters. So they exist only in, in biology when they are held by huge proteins that uh, provide binding sites for these individual atoms, such that they can assemble to form uh, this uh, complex. And the same is true for the hydrogenases uh, and uh, the cytochrome C oxidase. Now the CO converting enzymes were unknown when we started the work. But again, it's the problem of how is CO converted into CO2. You see? These are the so-called CO dehydrogenases. It's a process that generates a lot of energy uh, and it can be uh, it can run under anaerobic conditions, so without the participation of uh, uh, oxygen, dioxygen, and uh, uh, with the participation of oxygen. And we looked at uh, proteins that carry out this process under these two conditions. There is something special with CO. Uh, now, let's say all the three other uh, small gaseous substrates were uh, homodimers. 
N2, O2, uh, H2. Now this is a hetero uh, atom dimer, uh, and the molecule has uh, some special electronic properties. So uh, it is a dipole with the negative partial negative charge located on the carbon and a partial positive charge located on the oxygen. And therefore it is able to act as a electron, a sigma electron donor. And the metal then, usually a transition metal, then acts as a pi electron uh, donor which is accepted by uh, the carbon. So there is the possibility of relatively strong bonds between transition metals and uh, CO. Now because this is so, uh, CO binds to metalloproteins, in particular to uh, hemoglobin, for instance, uh, very strongly. Uh, so the oxygen carrier hemoglobin strongly binds CO and uh, poisons the hemoglobin. Uh, it binds practically uh, almost irreversible uh, and this leads to uh, the inactivation uh, of hemoglobin and leads finally to death then, uh, of uh, uh, human beings that uh, breathe uh, CO. Now, where does the carbon monoxide come from? Now, there are many sources uh, of CO uh, in the environment. Of course, uh, uh, power stations uh, that uh, run on coal or on gas uh, or on oil do burn these uh, carbon uh, sources only incompletely and there is a substantial portion of CO generated. Of course what we would like to have is that all of the carbon is burned to CO2 but this is not what happens. So we have a substantial CO generation here. The same thing is true with natural, uh, with wood fire, also incomplete uh, burning of the carbon and of course, its host of uh, our automobiles also contains a substantial portion of CO. Uh, most of it is now uh, removed, or some of it is removed with, with modern uh, filter techniques, but still a lot of CO is generated. Now, what the CO dehydrogenases do is that uh, which occurs in, in bacteria is they use uh, eventually water and CO to make CO2 and uh, uh, electrons uh, are generated in that way and protons and these are used then for uh, energy production. There is uh, a technical uh, process that uh, does the same what uh, we see in biology, the water gas shift reaction, which is the major chemical process that leads, uh, that is used to make hydrogen for uh, industrial purposes. And this, it's called, as I said, the water gas shift reaction. It is catalyzed by transition metals, mainly copper, zinc oxidases at a, a fairly high temperature. Now the basic mechanism of that is that there is the transition metal which binds CO and uh, in this way the CO 
becomes uh, electrophilic. Uh, electrons are drawn away from the carbon and it becomes attacked, it is attacked by a nucleophile which is an OH uh, hydroxyl ion uh, which occurs uh, in, in, in water and then this forms a covalent bond with the carbon and now we do already have the CO2 which uh, uh, is the reaction product and we have an intermediate metallohydrate which reacts with water liberating the hydrogen and then uh, the metal is uh, returned to the initial uh, state. So this is the principal catalytic cycle of the water gas shift reaction. You will see that in biology we find uh, these principal mechanisms uh, realized again but uh, in a very complex context of a protein molecule. So what you have minimally for CO oxidation you need an activation of the CO. CO in principle is chemically rather inert and this is by binding uh, to a transition metal. Then you need the activation of a water hydroxide uh, uh, molecule again by these uh, transition metals and then you need redox chemistry uh, that is uh, the metal hydrogen generation and the liberation of the hydrogen and the regeneration of the initial state of, of, of the metal. So these are the minimal requirements for an enzymatic CO uh, conversion. Now we come to uh, the bacteria themselves. There are a number of aerobic and in particular anaerobic uh, bacteria that live on uh, CO as carbon and energy uh, source. Uh, I first discuss this species which is uh, called Carboxydothermus hydrogenoformans so saying it lives on CO and makes hydrogen and uh, uh, Oligotropha carboxydoborans which means uh, it eats CO. Now the basic reactions these uh, uh, bacteria carry out is CO plus O2. It is uh, aerobic, as I said, to make CO2. This is a process that liberates a lot of energy. Now it has characteristic metals for that purpose and it is a very large protein with a molecular weight of about uh, 240 thousand or so. Uh, the anaerobic bacteria catalyze this reaction. There is no O2 around so they use water to oxidize CO, make CO2 and produce the hydrogen and uh, they use nickel and iron are also large proteins with a molecular weight of about uh, 120-130,000. So let me begin uh, with these species and look at the uh, enzymes that do this reaction. And then I come to the carboxydotrophic bacteria and begin with anaerobic CO respiration. Now these bacteria uh, uh, let me go back. So the carboxydothermus hydrogenoformans, they live, uh, for instance, are found in a crater lake, so under very low uh, oxygen uh, tension. And this is the protein that uh, 
uh, carries out this uh, enzymatic uh, reaction which I just showed, namely CO plus, H, uh, plus water gives CO2 plus hydrogen. It's a dimeric molecule. Uh, the protein chain is folded uh, mostly uh, alpha helically, and it carries the cofactors, these essential iron cofactors. Now, there, are, there is an, an internal cofactor, which uh, was of greatest interest to us, because here it is where the CO conversion takes place, and there are two more cofactors, uh, which are relatively well known, uh, well known because they occur in other proteins as well, uh, four iron, four sulfur uh, clusters. So obviously these are there in order to transfer uh, the electrons generated in here uh, further on to the surface. So there is now, in biology, there is no metal available. We do not have metal wires, so we have to transfer the electrons uh, in space from metal cofactor to metal cofactor. But this is actually possible. The electrons can jump or tunnel from here to here quite fast, so without an electrical uh, metal uh, connection. Now, there are two kinds of uh, anaerobic uh, CO dehydrogenases, the, the uh, uh, two and one. They are very closely related. This we can find by looking at the amino acid sequences. Now, one uh, primarily feeds its electrons into a hydrogenase, H2As. Both are similar, as I said. Uh, they do have this particularly interesting CO transforming cofactor and the other associated ones which serve electron transfer properties. So uh, the CO conversion is performed here. CO plus H2O gives CO2 plus protons. Now these are you, the, the electrons generated here are then fed into the uh, hydrogenase to make uh, hydrogen and at the same time uh, by a fact by a cofactor B uh, this protein complex is associated with the membrane and uh, the electrons are also used to transport protons across the membrane from the cytoplasm to the outside. So generating a proton gradient across the membrane, which is used then also by different components for energy production. Now the hydrogenase 2, the hydrogenase 2, which is very similar, uh, uh, almost identical, uh, does not feed into a uh, proton transfer chain, but uses the electrons uh, to for hydrogen production and for the reduction of NADP to NADPH, which is also an energy-rich uh, compound. The energetics of the process is like this. Uh, uh, there is a moderate amount of energy produced because the redox potential of CO, uh, CO2 and H2H uh, H plus uh, is, uh, is, is, is quite similar. But still, uh, this is sufficient for the bacteria uh, to live on. Now, how does the molecule look like in principle? This is a monomer. It consists of several domains, uh, a green domain, which uh, binds the active site cluster, blue domain, which also interacts with the active site cluster that you see here, and a red domain, which harbors the two 
conventional four iron four sulfur clusters. So this is the building uh, principle, the architectural principle of this. Now uh, it dimerizes. There is this internal CO active cluster and there are the four iron four sulfur clusters which serve electron transfer. And we also can look at this when moving. So uh, it forms an exact uh, dimer, the two halves, the two, the, the, the two subunits associate across a twofold molecular axis. And one of these cofactors lies exactly on the twofold axis. So it receives electrons from both branches. Well, the main interest in this protein was the nature of, let me go back, the nature of this complex. This was unknown. It was known that there is iron and nickel, but how uh, its it structure was, was unknown. So there were, of course, then uh, models proposed. And a model proposed for this cluster was this, so making a cubane type iron sulfur cluster and then uh, linked to a nickel in this configuration by an unknown ligand. This was speculation based on some spectroscopic data and it turned out to be uh, incorrect. So the correct structure came by X-ray crystallography and now you I think you see the power of crystallography uh, that we can see individual atoms and we can identify them. We can find out that this ball of electron density is an iron, this ball of electron density is a bridging sulfur, this is a nickel. <clears throat> and how do we differentiate iron and nickel? They uh, are in electron density very similar. Uh, differ by uh, one electron only. So we can differentiate by using, uh, well unfortunately I don't have that uh, picture here. We can differentiate by using uh, anomalous dispersion. Now what we do is we use for our analysis uh, X-rays that are close to the absorption edge of the iron and we use X-rays that are close to the absorption edge of nickel. And this we can select from the synchrotron X-ray sources because synchrotrons uh, emit uh, a broadband spectrum of X-rays and by setting the monochromators right we can uh, select uh, the right uh, wavelengths and differentiate between iron and nickel and clearly uh, identify uh, the nickel. So in this way we have now an atomic picture of this cluster of iron uh, and nickel which uh, uh, performs this, uh, uh, this uh, uh, difficult chemical reaction of oxidizing CO uh, using uh, water. Now, <clears throat> this is a bit more detailed with the, uh, with the individual bond lengths between the ligands that we find. And uh, this is the cluster. Now, this is a classical 4 iron 4 sulfur cluster. This is what we find in this noble iron nickel cluster. You see that it is... A, somewhat related to this. Here is a superposition. But what we do is to exchange this iron, move it to that place, and replace it by a nickel. And now this is essential for the unique uh, reactivity uh, of this, uh, which is shown here. This is the model for the CO oxidation. Nickel is, in fact, in this uh, uh, state of ligandation, 
uh, an acceptor for CO. Now we propose that the iron is an acceptor for the OH minus, and they are close enough that the reaction can occur and OH can attach to the carbon and CO2 be formed. Then of course electrons are generated. These are then transferred through this uh, iron cluster further on to the four iron, uh, four sulfur clusters that I showed uh, before. The protein structure provides binding sites for these metals. You see, but it also provides a pathway for the CO. Now when we look at the structure, which is a tightly packed protein, all of that is left out. What, what is shown here is just the empty uh, space inside the protein molecule, and we see a pathway which uh, is from the surface towards the nickel iron cluster which uh, uh, transform the CO, and then, as I said, uh, uh, electrons are generated, which then are transferred to these two uh, more uh, redox active uh, elements. So a marvelous construct uh, to guide the substrate directly to uh, the active site where it is uh, consumed. So we have the key elements here that I showed before, we have the CO bound to the transition metal being activated, we have the OH activated by the iron, and then the uh, uh, bond formation, CO2 formation, and uh, we have the electron transfer from the nickel to the iron cluster and then further on to the other uh, uh, redox partners. Now I come to the aerobic case. Now these are bacteria that are found in uh, when, when charcoal is produced. Uh, so there is obviously incomplete burning of wood, uh, but there is oxygen available. So this is where these bacteria live. Now they carry out, in principle, the same reaction, but do not use water as an oxidant, but use O2 as an oxidant. And they work with a protein that uh, bears no relationship whatsoever uh, to the previous uh, anaerobic CO dehydrogenase. It uses copper and uh, molybdenum. Uh, molybdenum, a very rare metal in biology, but it occurs sufficiently to, for, for this, uh, the formation of these uh, protein complexes. <coughs> now, these aerobic dehydrogenases of uh, here of oligotrophic carboxidoborans is a large protein complex, as you will see. It interacts with cytochromes, which are membrane-bound, and then electrons are uh, generated and uh, fed into membrane-bound cytochromes to make a uh, generate the proton gradient. Now, <clears throat> the reaction is much more uh, energetically favored because here dioxygen is available for oxidation of the CO, and it is uh, uh, almost uh, 1.5 uh, millivolt, 1.4 millivolt of, of, en of, of energy that can be used to uh, generate the proton gradient uh, across the membrane. Now, here four protons are transferred per consumed CO, while in the case of the anaerobic uh, uh, CO dehydrogen is only half a proton was transferred. So this is the advantage of having O2 uh, available for this process. The CO dehydrogenase itself 
uh, is very complex. It consists of uh, three different components, forms a dimer again. One that carries this cofactor, which we, would look, which we will look at uh, in more detail later. It carries a subunit that has uh, two iron, two sulfur clusters, and it carries a component that has a flavin, which becomes uh, reduced. So three components in one of these subunits and two of the subunits associate then to form the dimer. This is how the dimer looks like. As I said, a molecular weight of about uh, 240,000 per subunit. Now here are the individual cofactors. Here is the molybdenum copper cofactor. Here are the two iron, two sulfur cofactors, and here are the flavin. So again, you have a range, an arrangement such that electrons, which are generated here at the molybdenum site, flow through the protein uh, to the flavin and uh, reduce it. We had a problem uh, with this uh, material because the nature of the cofactor, so the metal content, was unclear uh, and chemistry couldn't tell us uh, about it. Uh, so we made, we, we again, we, we used X-rays to identify the metals. And this one can do, not in a diffraction experiment, but in an absorption and a fluorescence experiment. So what we do is take the crystal and uh, measure the absorption and the fluorescence by scanning uh, through different wavelengths of X-rays that we uh, uh, isolate by monochromatization from, from uh, the uh, X-ray beam of the synchrotron. So uh, in that way, uh, we can generate the spectrum which shows us there is iron in there. Uh, it shows us there is no, a very little nickel in there. It shows us there is copper in there. And it shows us there is selenium in there. Now this caused problems because copper and selenium are very similar in uh, atomic number and in electron density and they are difficult to, to differentiate. But we of course wanted to know uh, whether in the complex we do have copper or selenium. So this is the uh, situation that uh, we find we measure the absorption and we then find out that there is a gradually increasing absorption if we increase the wavelengths uh, from uh, uh, if we increase the wavelengths and when we come to a certain edge which is characteristic for the copper then it suddenly uh, uh, loses the absorption because there is no longer excitation of the metal by the x-rays and <clears throat> now the maximum absorption and minimum absorption are very close together. So maximum absorption is at 1.378 angstrom, minimum at 1.381 angstrom. Now this uh, uh, is very characteristic for the metal because you think that the closer similar zinc then absorbs at a different wavelength as does nickel. So we can use this absorption scan in order to identify a metal and we can do that in a site specific manner because we can take an X-ray diffraction experiment at this wavelength 
and at this wavelength. If we do it at this wavelength, we find a high electron density at this point. If we do it at this wavelength, we find no electron density at this point, clearly identifying this as copper. Not the molybdenum we had identified anyway. So this is part of the cofactor that uh, carries out CO reduction. <coughs> 